health and wellbeing meeting. This is a hybrid meeting and I'd remind members that as a committee of the council, it's being recorded and streamed live on the council website. We've got a very full agenda today due to it being the last meeting of the municipal year. So we'll continue to use the flagging system when there's two minutes remaining to help keep us on track. And just to remind everyone, because I always forget, there will be an alarm test, as always, at 11 this morning. Um, I've given permission to Councillor Joy Johnson to join us virtually. I can see you're here, so that's great. And I've received apologies in advance for Anthony McKeever, Alexandra McCann, Jenny Barnett, Jim Nicholson, Hannah Kofi, Sheila Murphy, Michelle Stapleton, Stephen Mayo, and are there any further apologies? Peter? From Alex Green, I'm representing EPUT and also from Jill Burns for Children's Services at NELT, and I'll be representing them as well. Thank you. Uh, sorry, yeah. Oh, and Margaret, sorry, you've got your hands up. Thank you, Councillor Arnold. Um, yes, Margaret Allen, I'm the Deputy Alliance Director for Thorough Alliance for the ICS, and I'm here to give a brief update on the phlebotomy issue that I think was on the action log. And my colleague, William Guy, will be arriving a little bit later to speak to you about another matter that's on the agenda. Sorry, I didn't have my mic on there. Feel free to interrupt me if you need to, to, to update the action log. Thank you. So going forward then, I'd like to suggest if board members are unable to attend future meetings, if they could please uh, nominate a deputy to attend on their behalf just to ensure that we've got representation and input from across all organisations whether that's virtually or in the room I just think it's important that we can share and, and have that pre-organic banter that we sometimes need to spring ideas moving on to agenda item two minutes and actions arising from the December's board meeting are provided at page five of the meeting papers are members content that the minutes are an accurate record? Yeah, thank you. We will now consider the action and decision log, which has been circulated electronically. There are currently five decisions open on the log. The decisions reflect the board agreeing proposals on previous agenda items relating to Adult Social Care Hospital Discharge Fund, Action 25, Initial Health Assessment, Action 26, Health and Wellbeing Strategy Domains in Focus, Domain 3, Person-Led Health and Care, Domain 5, Housing and the Environment, Actions 29 and 31, Business Case for the Mental Health Urgent Care Department, Action 33. Decisions are recorded on the log and closed following members' approval at the preceding meeting. Are members content to close the decisions and for them to be closed and recorded as an accurate record of the log? Yeah, agreed. There are several actions on the log which I can update members for. Action 15, the use of the platform OnlyFans and the possible exploitation of young females. It's been confirmed that it's not a platform of concern being highlighted by other professions, but it is, however, important to remain vigilant of the risks associated with the online space. So it's been monitored. Please refer to the action log for a more detailed update. Action 22, an update regarding the under-doctored position in Thurrock following from last year's HOSS papers. There'll be a verbal update which will be provided during the meeting. Action 23, data from QOF registers. GP contracts are not managed by MSE but by NHSE and QOF is a national NHSE programme. A link's been provided to the NHS digital site that presents QOF data. Uh, please see the action log for that full link. Action 27, a further initial health assessments update will be provided to the board during the next municipal year, date to be confirmed. The board secretariat will liaise with colleagues as part of the agenda setting up for upcoming health and wellbeing meetings. Action 28, Alexandra McCann to provide an update on the reinstatement of phlebotomy services within South Offenden. 
as we heard, Margaret's going to be here to do that. Colleagues are in the process of reinstating phlebotomy services in South Ockenden, currently waiting for the arrival of the bleed chair, we understand, um, and with the plan to reinstate service pr provision in February. But, Margaret, it would be great if you can update us further. Certainly. Thank you, Councillor Arnold. So the chair has been um, provided. It is now located in the room it needs to be in. The service at South Ockenden will start again on Tuesday, the 21st of February. Initially, for the first three weeks, it will be once a week. And at the end of the third week, which I think is the 6th of March, they'll evaluate whether they need to provide more sessions. Lovely. Thank you. That's great to hear. I know Ockenden residents will be really pleased about that, as will their councillors. Been a little bit drawn out, I know. <laughs> Um, action 30, service provision for male domestic violence is to be raised at the next Violence Against Women and Girls at meeting. Domestic violence, abuse and gender will be raised at the Violence Against Women and Girls Board and will report back to the Health and Wellbeing Board early in the next municipal year. I did want to sort of add to that, as because um, I know Councillor Ralph, it, it, it's a concern that you had is that I attended um, a MARAC meeting where everybody comes together to sort of all the different services and they're wrapping around families involved with abuse. And they are very acutely aware. One of, one of the cases was where they at first thought the victim was female and then they realised it was the male that was a victim. So they, they are picking that up within that service as well, if that offers you some comfort, and then obviously supporting that person in the way that they can. So it's not that men are being ignored in the system. I think it's a different way of handling it, but we'll obviously get more out later. I don't know if you want to comment on that action at all. Do you, are you happy with that? Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, uh, since the, the last meeting, uh, well, I've been contacted by a few of the charity groups that still feel they've not been engaged with um, when it comes to male domestic violence uh, as victims. Um, I, I just think there needs to be more work done on stats and figures to bring it in line with what we know, but it's good to hear that, that he's being picked up. Yeah. And once, once we, that action's complete, I'm sure we'll have that information that you're requiring. So, action 32, an update on the mental health urgent care department is to be provided to the board in the next municipal year. The Board Secretariat will again liaise, liaise with colleagues as part of the agenda setting for the upcoming meetings. Action 34, board members are asked to provide Joe Broadbent with any questions on the violence and vulnerability, vul vulnerability table, I'm sorry, um, from the December meeting. As of the 16th of January, no comments from the board members were received. Joe, would you like to give us any kind of update or does anybody want to comment on that for Joe? Um, no further comments have been received, but this continues to be monitored through the Youth Crime Governance Board, uh, which obviously reports into the Community Safety Partnership. So there's, there's robust monitoring um, of the agenda. Thank you. Are members content to close the actions? Yeah. So moving on to agenda item three, urgent items of business. I've not received any urgent items in advance of the meeting. Agenda item four, declaration of interest. Do any members wish to make any declaration? declaration? Dear, I need to uh, untangle my tongue today, don't I? I might even not say that. Declare any interests? <laughs> no, thank you. Moving on to agenda item five, virtual items for consideration. Unfortunately, due to the recent number of items for consideration at board meetings, the board has been asked to virtually consider the following needs assessments, alcohol and substance misuse, self-care for long-term conditions, active travel. A mindful virtual sign-off for these detailed documents is not ideal and going forward the sequencing and discussion of such reports will be considered further and my apologies Joe that um, first year of running it, it, it is remiss of me to not get that fitted in for you and I, I do apologise for that. 
to provide a concise summary of the needs assessments, a briefing note for each will be circulated along with the full documents. These reports were presented at January's HOSP meeting, therefore supporting PowerPoint slides will also be circulated. If board members are not content with these documents being published on the Council Joint Strategic Needs Assessment webpage, please contact Joe Broadbent via close of play on Friday the 24th. If on this basis, are the board content to consider these reports virtually? If we are, they'll be sent afterwards. So are you happy to do that? Yep, thank you, if that's agreed. Uh, moving on to agenda items six and seven, health and wellbeing strategies remains in focus. For year one, I agreed in recognition that the strategy was launched in July, that reports should provide a summary of domain and priorities and setting out plans for delivery for year one. From year two, we'll focus on what has been achieved during year one and our next steps. A covering report for both items six and seven is provided at page 15 of your papers. A supporting report for Domain 2, Building Strong and Cohesive Communities, is provided on page 31. 20 minutes has been provided for this item, comprising a 10-minute presentation and 10 minutes Q&A. So I'd like to ask Natalie Smith to introduce Domain 2, Building Strong and Cohesive Communities. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this Domain uh, 2 is focusing on Building Strong and Cohesive Communities which aims to reduce inequalities for everyone, but we're committed to ensuring that the most marginalised and seldom heard communities enjoy the same level of opportunity, health and well-being as the most affluent. Our approach builds on community strengths and increasing social value. We are building on the positives from COVID-19, such as community-led support, while seeking to mitigate the negative impacts of the pandemic and increase cost of living. In doing so, we give people the opportunity to find their own solutions make healthy choices and access support where needed. There's three goals within this domain and I'll give a, a brief overview of each. The first goal is goal 2A, which relates to improved engagement with residents to ensure everyone can have their voice heard. This involves joining up engagement opportunities and thinking about the borough in terms of the four primary care network areas. We're making best use of the community anchors across the borough, such as libraries, community centres, different community assets and trusted locations to help share, informa share information and gather intelligence on people's priorities through health and social care whilst having those engagements through those trusted locations. It also means that um, we're trying to ensure the Stronger Together database is regularly updated and promoted to enable those connections across the borough. We've held a number of events that have sought to um, gain that intelligence and, and to ensure that information is updated on a regular basis. The second goal ensures that people have the skills, confidence and ability to contribute as active citizens and that they are empowered to co-design the decisions that affect their lives. This involves promoting opportunities for particip participation and removing the barriers such as digital exclusion through improving access and skills. Fundamentally, this goal intends to encourage and enable community-led action to support local improvements to influence decisions. The third goal, Goal 2C, enhances equality and inclusiveness by promoting opportunities to bring different communities together, to enhance shared experience and to embed a sense of belonging. This goal seeks to strengthen our approach as policy makers to improve equality outcomes for residents, but, but, but both understanding the evidence base for different communities as well as their lived experience. This goal also seeks to build cohesion in a growing borough with increasing diversity. The success of this domain is dependent on our partnership with the voluntary community and faith sector in its widest form, and it builds on a shared commitment of the best outcomes for Borough residents. Very happy to take any questions or comments about the, um, about the report. Thank you, Natalie. Can you advise what progress is being made against these commitments? I'm mindful June is only a few months away, so can you confirm that we are on target? And if not, what the necessary actions are that are being taken? I feel we are on target. We're exploring all opportunities we can to um, explore new opportunities where they, where they present. 
um, around each of the three goals. Um, so I do think there's been good progress. Um, obviously, a lot of our work is dependent on the capacity within the voluntary sector to work with us. Um, and that capacity has been stretched since COVID. But those commitments, as I say, are very much still there to, to progress work. And we do all we can to, to further those opportunities as we can. Do members have any comments or questions? Councillor Muldowney. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, so there's a lot of good work and I think sort of it is all pointed in the right direction. Um, the first question that I've got, I think it's a little light on what's actually going to be done. Um, and I'm a little bit worried that um, there aren't smart goals there that can be measured. So I'm not sure what measurement you're using to know whether you're successful or not. And I think sort of the really blinding thing that's that's not there for me is how will the how is the council's you know catastrophic financial position going to impact on the delivery of this strategy in each of these two realms but overall as well thank you councillor if i take the first one um we we are continuing to explore different actions to um, pursue this, this goal. And sometimes that is about us setting the direction, but sometimes it is about those conversations which help to um, co-design solutions. And that work does take more time to, to tease out, but we have some plans to progress that work over the, over the coming months. For example, we've got a pilot in one PCN area where, where the engagement will help to not only identify more priorities, but what can be done, sometimes by services, sometimes by communities themselves. And sometimes going back to the specifically the goal um, 2B is then about exploring, well, what barriers might there be to taking that work forward and what can be done to replace those, so to, to remove those, sorry. So um, I, th I think we are very much on target, but a lot of the work does depend on those discussions and um, co-producing the direction with communities and with target groups so that we can make the progress. But um, I, I feel like we're in a good place to be able to take that forward. Can you, can you point to sort of anything that has actually had an impact at the ground level? Because obviously as a local councillor, um, you know, my residents make me very well aware of, I mean, their number one issue at the moment is the lack of GP appointments and being able to access their GP, I think would probably this is covered more in the next domain that's coming up. So uh, that is urgent, that is important and urgent. So what kind of impact are we making on these? It sounds as if we're still very much at the stage of fleshing out what we're gonna do. Is that is that fair to say? Or has there actually been things done which are likely to have an impact at the ground level, which is what what the residents want at the end of the day, you know? Otherwise, the strategy is just a lot of buzzwords, really. So in terms of something like um, accessing GPs, I think the, the main um, support that this domain can give to that is about empowering communities to make sure that they know where they can go for information, where they can go for um, support if they're not being able to get the access that they can get. I think the actual work on the, the access probably takes part, place outside this domain. But we need to make sure that um, residents understand uh, what they're entitled to and how they can go about raising concerns when they're not able to get that access and what the alternatives might be. So could it be a pharmacy or could it be uh, an, another um, opportunity? And I think there's been some, some good work around that in terms of um, both conversations uh, with um, primary sources, maybe such as, you know, Health Watch and, and organisations that are dealing directly with those issues, but also secondary outlets such as uh, libraries, where we're in a position to be able to talk to people about um, alternative ways of accessing advice and support. But being able to empower people so that they feel um, in, they're able to um, make, make the decisions that impact on their lives, they're able to get the support that they need is fundamental to this domain. And it's, it's more around that aspect rather than the direct conversations with, with GPs maybe that um, we're able to support more through this, through this piece of work. Uh, how far along do you think we are to being successful on that? Because, I mean, my observations... Could I, sorry, could I interrupt there? Because we do have a verbal update on GPs and under-doctoring 
for item eight. So I think there's other partners in the room that might be able to answer your questions. Okay. But in terms of actually working with residents to empower them to be able to know where to go to get help, etc. I mean, in terms of your measurement of success of this strategy so far, how would you say we 80% on that? Because oh, my, oh. my sort of anecdotal evidence from, from the ground level is that nobody knows and everybody's frustrated and they and the perception of Health Watch, I'm afraid, is that they side with the organisations and not with the residents. So, I think as your second question um, raises, it is very difficult sometimes to have smart measures against some of the work that we do, and we have to accept that. Um, we we can um, we, we can take confidence from the work that we do, but there's always going to be more, more work that to be done. Um, so we, we, that's not something I feel that we can measure. There are. Um, a range of measures that we can look at to, to test um, the effect of our work and the impact of our work, but sometimes the correlation isn't as direct as we would like because the, the systems are not in place. So we keep um, up to date on measurements such as volunteering within the council and the number of placements on offer. That helps us to give some insight into the level of um, activity within communities and uh, people's willingness to come forward and volunteer. But to be able to do more measure than that, that we just don't have the um, structures in place that would, would enable that. Again, on another measurement, um, we look at the activities that are supported through libraries and community hubs and the uptake. Um, it, it's, it's not a panacea, but it gives us an indication of whether um, activities and whether um, offers of support are being accessed in the way that they hope that they will. Um, and we can take some um, direction from that. And could you answer Thank my you previous so question about how, what's the impact of the council's financial situation on this strand of the strategy? Can we, sorry, Les is wanting to add to the, your previous question, so perhaps if we can bring Les in and then come yeah, back. Yeah, that's fine. We've, I we've, just we've got don't want that question to get lost. Thank you. Yeah. Well, actually, it's to both. Um, first one, so health inequalities are much broader than just access to GP services, although that is important, I accept that. Um, so the whole of the community activity that we've been doing um, is, is geared towards improving um, accessibility for everybody, but particularly for those marginalised groups. So just a couple of practical examples. Community-led support teams, now all of our social work teams are embedded in the communities around primary care networks. They hold uh, informal drop-in sessions um, called talking shops, and there's real strong evidence coming through already that that's increasing accessibility for people, but it's also allowing people to have a much earlier conversation. So rather than the kind of old formal process of applying for a service and then having to have someone come around to your house to do a formal assessment and then you know, getting something, often quite late in the day. Now people are much more likely to drop in to have a conversation. It's having a real impact in terms of prevention. Um, and the, the community-led support teams are linking across the whole range of different services. So they've, they've got housing colleagues often in the same room or certainly... Um, they work closely with housing colleagues, they're working closely with health colleagues. So that whole change in terms of how we access the community and how they access our services is having a, a profound impact on some of those areas that we know people's health inequality is driven by um, an, Ill an inability to get the right service at the right time and often early enough because um, a lot of inequalities are created by the social um, conditions that people are living in. So by addressing things like housing, addressing things like um, debt sometimes or various things that come through the door, um, we're, we're being able to um, be much more effective with those people. So th there is evaluations of that and they are coming forward. And when we do the formal evaluation in, in the summer, uh, we will bring to bear all of those stories. The issue is very complex, so it's quite difficult sometimes to have smart type objectives, sort of classic performance type indicators around some of these things, because they can of often obscure more than they reveal. 
So it's really stories where you start to get the richness of what's happening and it's really, it's really through that kind of qualitative evaluation that you start to see the impact you're having. So I'm confident that we will be able to bring back good evidence of community-led support and other, other things that we're doing that will show that, that we are having an impact. Um, one, you know, as an aside, we have communities of practice now operating in, in, in those areas where we bring together a range of people and, and through community builders. For example, we found out early on that the, the, the closure of Barclays Bank in the middle of Corringham was going to be uh, problematic for a lot of people. It was particularly a lot of people who were going to be um, find it difficult to do their banking, couldn't get online because they weren't comfortable with that and they didn't want to travel a long way to do their banking. So um, through that and the intervention that we made, we were able to keep that branch open in, in Corringham Library for a couple of days a week. Not obviously a health-related thing, but actually if people are worrying about their finance, if people are, 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 are not able to access their banking um, as they traditionally did, it is an issue and it's that kind of complex issue that often brings to bear in terms of people's health and well-being. So it's a practical example of, of, of where we can do something through having that better engagement. Second question, the one around um, the council finances. Clearly we're in a very different context than we were when, than when we wrote the strategy. There's no question of that and there's no point trying to avoid that difficulty. However, we are still completely committed to the, to the transformation program. A, because it's the right thing to do and it will improve outcomes, but also it's the most efficient thing to do because we know that we've set out a program that looks at failure demand, that controls demand, that makes our services more effective, um, and in the long run will reduce the need uh, or reduce the, the, the cost of adult social care and health by making much more effective use of what we've got. So, so there's no reason to dismantle it. However, the impact of the kind of position we find ourselves in and the cost controls that we now have in place inevitably means that the timetable for some of that and the prioritization of some of that will have to be looked at because we probably can't do everything that we wanted to do at the same pace for those reasons. But the longer term view of commitment to delivering the things that we said we were going to deliver in that strategy is, is still um, completely there. Thank you, Les. Councillor Ralph. We're Thank you, Chair. Um, I actually want to go on to uh, connecting about all the 28 sheltered housing complex, so the, the network. Um, I've had feedback on how residents are really enjoying being connected up to this. Do you know the rollout of this to the other shelter housing complexes like O'Donoghue House or stuff like that, because it's bringing a real benefit. I don't, but we can find out and come back to you if that's okay, Councillor. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Councillor Lidiard. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Natalie. Very, very strong uh, strategy as far as I'm concerned. But as you know, I, I spend a couple of mornings at uh, Tilbury Hub every week, and I don't really see um, much change. Uh, there seem to be quite a few barriers to more people using the hubs, you know, using the warm space. A couple of examples um, would be, of course, closure lunchtime. And I get frustrated because I'd like to see it open all day. I often see people knock on the door at lunchtime, they can't come in. Or if you want somewhere warm to sit, You've actually got to <laughs> go out at quarter to one and come back at quarter to two. And but, um, I'm sorry, we, we, we've only got two minutes. We've got a really okay. full agenda. Right, well, if we I was can, just say, can, yeah, I if you can answer sorry. the question, Councillor Lydia, that'd be great. Sorry. I recognise those frustrations, Councillor. Um, we're doing all we can to increase opening hours where we can um, across the library network, um, and uh, we can talk about. Tilby in particular, I find. Thank you. I'm, I'm really sorry I've had to cut you short there. Um, 
I, it's very quickly, I, I, I want to add before we go off. Under goals two and A, you mentioned focused mapping of assets to PCNs, and at 2C, integration of equality impact assessments and health impact assessments. I think they're three very vital areas and should be given due regard across all directorate reports. It's the foundation bricks to stop silo thinking. How do you see this working and being embedded? Thank you, Councillor. So um, the fo focus mapping is really happening through the Stronger Together directory, um, and that's um, a, a, a really about using all the networks we have to encourage everyone to um, register what their offer is for Thurrock and to make sure that then it's promoted not just digitally, but also through um, community forums, through um, notice boards, etc., so that we can make people aware of what is available online so that people can get that support if they're not online. In terms of um, equality impacts, we're very focused on this piece of work. We took out a review last summer and we're progressing a number of actions to help improve our approach across, the, across all directorates, as you, uh, as you asked. Um, we've explored some work with health e equality impacts and guidance is being updated so that um, the link is made at, at, um, at a universal level with health inequality impacts with more support available from public health should a health impact assessment be required. We've reviewed training, we've updated um, the approach to um, EQIAs and we continue to do so as new guidance and policy comes into place. For example, recently um, veterans and serving personnel have been included, not because they're a protected characteristic, but because um, taking the consideration into uh, account is, is a good practice move when we're completing those assessments. There are a number of other actions that we've got planned going forward to make sure that this is embedded and that we're um, helping officers to really uh, not just look at the data that's in front of them at a desktop, but maybe engaging with those communities more effectively so that lived experience comes through. And that brings back the connection to the database on Stronger Together so that we can find those um, maybe smaller communities that maybe not be as visible um, to officers when they're carrying out that work. But those connections can make all the difference to informing how a policy uh, might land when it's um, implemented. Absolutely, thank you. That's music to my ears. I, I, I want to see officers from other directors going out and getting into the community and seeing the area that they're writing options for. And I'll probably spring the same question on you, Jeff, uh, under your report, just to sort of like connect the dots for us. Moving on, it's recommended that members consider and comment on the plans for delivery domain to strong uh, building strong and cohesive communities of the health and wellbeing strategy. Are members content to approve? Councillor Muldoney, you've got your hand up. C could it be something that you, we can take up outside of the room with Natalie? So we've got a full agenda and we're already running over time. And to be honest, you, you had sort of like 60% of the time for your questions. So, and I know it's really important. I do very much appreciate that. But is it something we could do after the meeting? Thank you, Councillor Muldowney. Thank you for your um, consideration there. So are we happy to approve? Yeah, thank you. Moving on to agenda item seven, domain four, opportunity for all. An additional supporting report is provided at page 41 of your papers. 20 minutes has been provided for this item, comprising 10 minutes presentation, 10 minutes q and I'm pleased to ask Zara Godw Godward, sorry if, if I said your name wrong there, to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Sarah Godward, a consultant in public health and assistant director in the public health team. I joined the team last March. I was asked to coordinate a summary of the current position against the priorities under this domain, domain four of the health and wellbeing strategy, which were agreed in June last year. You have the detail of the activity in front of you, and I'm not proposing to take you through it line by line. Um, a few highlights. This domain focuses on inclusive growth, ensuring that economic development benefits the local community. It aims to support people in their aspirations and their skills development, and to encourage people to be active in the community, either in employment or through, through volunteering. 
And in this respect in particular, there were strong links to domain two that you just heard about. The approach is both to identify particular groups within the community and make a specific offer of help to them, but also to ensure that new ventures, um, and I'm thinking of examples such as the Freeport, are designed in such a way that they open up new opportunities for residents. I'll point you to slide four. There are four domain goals, which broadly are, the first one is raising aspiration amongst children and young people. The second is raising aspirations and skills development amongst adults. The third is about more secure employment. And the fourth is about attracting inward investment for the borough. The delivery of this domain is through the strategies for the Brighter Future strategy, which is the children, adult learning and skills strategy, the local plan, the back of Derek strategy, and the new emerging um, cultural strategy. So where are we now? We're in the first year. I draw your attention to slide 13. You can see I found it difficult to fit in all the activity that's happening um, under, under this domain on one page. So for young people, there are a number of activities which are designed to raise their aspirations and improve their skills and to help them to transition into the, the world of work. For adults, there is a new skills implementation plan Derek has been awarded £50,000 to implement the Multiply programme, which is for people to develop functional skills in maths. And we're working on um, extending the support for digital skills that's already available in the borough to um, increase digital inclusion. Derek was successful in secur securing funds for more than £250,000 from the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, through which it's delivering a number of different projects one of which is to support a new initiative, which is to identify the people in our community who are economically vulnerable, in fuel poverty, and at risk of worsening health as a consequence to provide them with additional support. The Tilbury-based community development project is still under evaluation, but I note that it awarded 64 small grants, which already indicates it was popular and uh, accessible. There's been a refresh of the various relevant websites um, for, for business and the Business Buzz newsletter has been refreshed to raise awareness of the available opportunities to local businesses and new uh, initiatives. There was a good response um, to the survey of businesses which was undertaken at the end of last year, which will be used to inform the priorities for Next year, the Back and Derrick strategy is um, being refreshed at the moment. There is a new group um, which was set up a few months ago, which is specifically directed towards understanding how we can encourage anchor institutions within the community, so that's the NHS, the council, the colleges, um, to use their power and influence to the benefit of the local community and this is starting um, with looking at procurement, so looking at the buying power of large, organisa large organisations within the borough to um, benefit local suppliers. I'm happy to take questions. Um, I might not be the person who's closest to answering your questions, but I'll do my best and uh, perhaps I can um, go back to ask some more detail and come back. Um, if I'm not able to ask your questions immediately. Thank you. I'm sure Joe will help us out as well on some of the questions if we've got them. Councillor Rao, oh, sorry, Jeff, you, you nodded it. Did you want to come in and say something? So, Councillor Rao. Uh, thank you, and congratulations on fitting all that onto one slide. <laughs> it was quite an effort. Um, I guess mine's quite a general question. We are talking about disadvantage of youths and, and children. What I see in wider communities is that we have a set of children that the needs disengage with learning at school. Where do we sit in picking up their education outside the school setting? Because I think some people, they don't want to, you put them into a, a school setting they don't feel safe in, they won't engage. And so I know like with youth centres in other areas they do 
a, set, a skill set qualification within that youth centre. Is there anything we're looking at to do that to engage with those children? So I spoke to the person who um, is responsible on the council for the needs of children who are not in education, employment or training. And she was um, very confident that Thurrock is actually an outlier in a positive sense in um, being able to identify the children in this, the children and young people in this position. I mean, I don't need to tell you, their needs are many and varied and in the solution is not a one size fits all. Um, there are a number of activities which are specifically directed towards them in terms of encouraging them into um, employment and, and jobs, but also other, other specific one-to-one -one help to encourage them to um, join the volunteering opportunities that already um, exist in the borough. And specifically, we were talking recently about whether this might be a particular group of young people who might be interested in supporting um, our proposals to support other people in digital inclusion. Councillor Mordoni. Thank you, Chair. Um, what is the current educational attainment gap between the, the most advantaged and the most disadvantaged? And what is the ambition, what is the target for reducing that? I'm afraid I don't have that to hand at the, at the moment and I wouldn't like to hazard a guess. But it, I know it is significant and persistent um, and it will require additional activity in order to, 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 to fill that gap. I can send you the information, the specifics after the meeting if, if that would be helpful. Yes, that would be helpful, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I suppose my question is really like broadly over that whole domain of, are we confident that the deliverables are on track? I think it's, we're coming to the end of our first year. I think it's a question I'm going to be asking. So the various elements under this domain, I think I'm thinking through them now. I think they're in various states of maturity. So some like the, the Tilbury project is completed and is under evaluation, but the early signs are positive. Um, some of the work is comparatively new. The skills plan was signed off couple of months ago um, but I don't think that means that activity wasn't happening um, the overall impression that I've had from speaking to the various players who are involved in the delivery of these different elements has been positive and enthusiastic I think it's going to be clearer um, in probably over the coming year, but perhaps even longer for some of these initiatives, because they take a long time to, to bed in and become sustainable. Um, I, th I think we can monitor progress and ensure it's in the right direction, but some of these, so some of these aims are, are really very long term. Thank you. Rita? Um, just a comment, and Jeff may um, bring this in as well. I think that might be why you were nodding earlier. So we have real opportunities where we're working in partnership. So one of the areas um, there's been a lot of investment and development is in anchor organisations. So again, we have real opportunity working across health and care because the NSEFT have already established a significant portfolio around anchor institutions. We are obviously trying to develop people within our own communities to work within our own communities as well and be empowered and see different career opportunities for themselves and their children as well. Real opportunity in terms of partnership working here. So it's not about inventing something different, but building on those relationships, which I think Jeff might have been uh, nodding to earlier. Thank you. Yes, it's very true. And it, it's a journey and it has to be at community's pace and it's it's very different to being in a salaried role within work and an expectation on you. We, we've got to enable people and bring them along on a journey that they want to come on. Jo? Thanks. And just to add, um, similar to your point on the previous domain about 
embedding equality and health and equality impact assessment. I think for us as a group to influence embedding that thinking about inequalities, thinking about differential access to opportunities in every strategy. So for example, for the new place leadership and growth board that's been set up as part of the um, IRP, we've worked very hard to make sure that's about inclusive growth. Um, to, to bring in that, um, that inequalities element that will help deliver the, get the aims of this summit. Thank you, and yeah, that, that's why I feel it's vital to bring both health and the equality assessment and impact of that into every strategy. And that's kind of why I wanted to say the appendix. I got really excited about the appendix. And um, once we get domains two and four added into that, I think it's a document that should be shared widely across all officers within the council, across all members, just to sort of highlight to people that there are strategies sitting underneath this strategy and do your research, look at those strategies before you start to build your options, get out of your chair, go to your community and talk to them. I think it's vital that we start to do that. We've been talking about it and I think going forward next year is the year of action. Uh, any more questions? Councillor Mordoni? Can you point to any examples of where this strategy is actually having impact on the ground? Because, I mean, obviously we're here. What we want to see is improvement for the residents. So uh, I think you've touched on a couple maybe. Um, but what are, you pr what are you proudest of in terms of impact? Or are we not at that stage yet with this strategy? And if not, when will we be at the stage where we'll be showing the actual impact? and some improvement for residents on the ground. Because obviously it's quite an urgent situation that we're in, in terms of economics at the moment, you know, both locally and nationally. This particular domain um, covers enormous breadth, so, breadth, so it's actually quite hard to think about what I would um, highlight um, in, in particular. And the detail of the delivery of the, the different items is under the delivery plans of the underpinning strategy. But there is one particular piece of work um, that, that strikes me that you might be interested in, which I briefly mentioned earlier, which is to do with specific targeted support to the people who are most at risk of worsening health as a consequence of fuel poverty. So this is involving um, joined up working across the council, particularly between, but not, ex not, um, not just housing and, and public health. Um, and the UK Shared Prosperity Fund has funded an additional financial inclusion officer. We've, impr we've already improved the pathways of referral, so starting to get referrals from, from health, from, from GPs. But the, um, and to improve the information that's available to residents. But, and in, a, in addition, we're, we're using the data that we have um, in the system to identify the people who'd be most at risk and proactively offer them support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, We've now had the opportunity to consider all the strategy domains and priorities for year one and are looking ahead for year two. So as part of this, we'll need to evaluate and reflect on the first year, which is what I think we're sort of saying here anyway, of the strategy via an annual report at the first meeting of the municipal year. I think this will allow a, you said we did uh, look back at the last year and the next steps for commitments that may not have been achieved and the reason why. And I also think, as this is an organic process, we should consider what we may need to think about changing as we go forward. Um, it's recommended that members consider and comment on the plans for delivering domain, I think we've commented, um, opportunity for all for the health and wellbeing strategy. Are members content to approve the recommendation? Yes. Thank you. And thank you, Zara. Um, moving on to agenda item eight, verbal update on the current under doctor in position in Thurrock. 
This is a follow-up to last year's HOSC report, which outlined the challenges associated with the under-doctoring position within Thurrock and the impact of this. An update will now be provided by Will Guy. Councillor Arnold, can I just mention that Will hasn't yet been able to join the meeting. I think he's due any minute now. OK. I'll get my, my tech guy. He's, he's not there trying to join. Let's see if we can call him in. OK. Rita, can I, can I put you on the spot if, if Will's not here to maybe just... Margaret, oh, sorry. Margaret. Sorry, Margaret will be updated, but I can actually support. Margaret, sorry. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I can't. Will is our director of primary care. He's, he's the person that will have the information about this. Unfortunately, I do not. But let me see if I can, I can get him to join uh, immediately. Thank you. Was there anything, Rita, that you could maybe sort of share a little I bit while, while we're waiting, if you, if you don't mind? Sure. Sorry. So specifically for me would be obviously um, Coringham Integrated Medical and Wellbeing Centre in terms of the recruitment of the GP fellows. Um, so I can assure you on that position in terms of we, the aim was to recruit 12 GP fellows. Um, and our last position was that we had 10 in the pipeline in terms of the recruitment position with one having actually have started. Um, but I know that the group continued to meet. Um, so Leslie Roberts within the ICB is meeting with um, teams locally to continue that recruitment campaign. In addition to that, we've also seen the success of the acute respiratory overflow, infection overflow hub at Coringham Integrated Medical and Wellbeing Centre, which have actually seen GPs see up to 60 people per day. Um, at Coringham IMWC, which has obviously had significant impact in terms of taking, uh, managing people locally, but actually taking that pressure away from a &E as well and improving the experience. Thank you. Margaret, is he, has he been able to join? Perhaps we'll, we'll move on and if, if uh, Will manages to join us, we'll come back to that. I have sent him an urgent email. Okay, thank you. Oh, here he is. Okay. Will, over to you. Hey, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can yeah, hear cool. you. Thank you. Um, I'm William Guy, the Director of Primary Care for Mid and South Essex. Um, apologies, I come with some level of brief for this discussion, but um, not a complete brief, so I will attempt to give an update as to where we're at, but by all means do ask for further questions if I've not covered any issues off. Um, so thank you very much for inviting us back to talk through the progress that we're making on the um, level of, of GP provision in Thurrock. Um, I got a, a bit of a briefing from Stephen Porter um, from previous meetings, um, and what I've got for you today is an update on progress we're making, not just in terms of GP recruitment, but in terms of broader um, provision of primary care capacity in the Thurrock area. I think it's probably important in terms of context. Um, we do set out that whilst GPs remain a crucial part of primary care provision, for a number of years, locally and nationally, um, the primary care agenda has changed somewhat to, to a more GP-led model of primary care. Um, rather than one that is solely provided by GPs and practice nurses. Um, there's obviously a, a much broader staffing contingent that's now supporting delivering primary care services, and that will only expand over time. Um, that being said, as I say, um, general practice is, is critical. GP, uh, GPs are, are, are critical within the provision of primary care, um, and Thurrock is obviously affected by low numbers. Um, as an ICB, we've put in place a number of initiatives, some which are ICB wide, um, that support the recruitment and retention of GPs. Um, but I will start on a very specific Thurrock based scheme. So I think the, the ICB recognises that 
Um, Thurrock is particularly challenged when it comes to GP recruitment, um, and therefore we have applied additional capacity to try to um, progress recruitment of GPs in the, in the Thurrock area. And at the heart of that has been a GP fellowship scheme. Whilst GP fellowship schemes exist elsewhere, we have a bespoke offer in Thurrock that we don't offer elsewhere in, in Mid and South Essex. The GP fellowship scheme is essentially trying to get newly qualified GPs um, to want to start their careers in a particular area, in this case in Thurrock. And hopefully in doing so, then um, see out the rest of their careers in, in that area. Um, and what we've developed um, working with system partners is a kind of a very uh, flexible option for um, for newly qualified GPs. We've recognised that a lot of people coming out of um, medical school are seeking portfolio careers. They're not necessarily wanting to come and do 100% of their time in general practice. Um, that they actually like the opportunity to develop a certain um, specialism um, alongside general practice work, potentially some kind of other career development um, work around that. And so we've created a scheme as an ICB that effect effectively supports people to identify practices that they can come and work in and deliver general practice services, but equally alongside that, um, how we can support them in, in, in developing that specialism um, and, and their, their own personal development. Um, and we started to promote that scheme back in July time. And I'm pleased to say that we have now had um, six candidates express a very strong interest in taking up roles in the Thurrock locality as a result of that. That seems relatively small, um, but I will add a caveat onto that. When when we started to promote, a lot of the, the, the previous round of, of medical students had kind of reached a point where they'd, they qualified and started to find um, roles by the time we were advertising and therefore we were slightly late to the market um, uh, as a result. However, we will continue to do this on an ongoing basis. So those six expressions of interest, we're now working through closely with them to try to identify um, GP practices they can start to work in um, and, and, and um, develop their career in, um, and equally the, the um, specialist support to, to enable them to develop those specialist roles. So that will, um, over time, that scheme, I, I think, will attract a large number of GPs into the into the Thurrock locality and as I said we've deliberately taken a decision as an ICB to restrict that to um, to just Thurrock um, at this point in time because of the, the, the situation in Thurrock in terms of, of recruitment. More broadly um, the other development that we have been really trying to push forward on to try to recruit uh, new GPs to the area is our training capacity so as people may be familiar with um, people will spend a, a significant period there um, uh, medical training um, on placement in, in various different sectors. A lot of them go into acute uh, the hospital services, um, but we want as many people to come out into primary care as possible. Um, and so we have developed our training capacity across Mid and South Essex um, by an additional 150 posts since um, 2018. They are not that 150 isn't specific to Thurrock, but there are a number in Thurrock um, of, of additional trainee posts. And the premise with that is, is, is twofold. A, as a nation, we obviously need to develop as many GPs as we can. Um, but actually, if you have a good experience in a, in a training practice, the, the chances are you will try to then find um, long term career options in that area, potentially within that practice. Um, and so that increase in training uh, places is, is hugely important to us. Um, obviously, alongside the medical school at Anglia Ruskin um, now, I'm starting to see its first um, medics qualified this summer. Um, so that work will continue um, and we're trying to continually increase the number of trainee places um, in, uh, in, in Thurrock and in the other um, parts of Mid and South Essex. Um, we have got then a number of, of um, initiatives that sit alongside that. Some are targeted at new GPs, some are targeted at trying to keep people in their kind of mid-career where they might be having doubts over whether they want to continue in, in primary care. Um, and some are looking at the end of people's career as people who don't necessarily want to take full retirement, but, but seeking to stay on uh, in, in general practice for longer. And so there's a huge variety of initiatives. 
um, some solely targeted at, at GPs um, and others at, at practice nursing staff and, and, and other roles across um, the primary care setup. So that, that work um, continues. Um, and again, we try where we can to slant that to the thoric context and work with alliance partners in the thoric um, team to, to make sure that those offers are, can be as bespoke to thoric as, as, as possible. Um, and we are starting to see um, some improvements in trends on that front. The other kind of critical part of, of um, the, the workforce development is around the additional roles reimbursement scheme. So nationally, um, there is um, a plan to address capacity within primary care through the expansion of new roles within um, a primary care setting. Um, so people might be familiar with now going to see their GP and, and, and potentially being seen by a pharmacist, a physio, a social prescriber, um, any number of roles. Um, the process for that working is there is a national funding pot that gets aligned at a primary care network level, of which there are four primary care networks in Thurrock. Um, and then the, the primary care networks have to go and recruit those staff, develop them and train them. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that there has been some success with that in, in Thurrock, but there's further opportunity and we're looking at how we can support the PCNs to increase their not only their recruitment of those roles, but actually bring them to full fruition. Um, one of the key bits of learning we've, we've experienced, um, not unique to Thurrock, but across, across the country, is that a lot of those roles aren't traditional primary care roles and actually taking them out of the environments they're in and bringing them into primary care, there is an awful lot of um, development required with those staff in order to bring them up to full effectiveness. Likewise, primary care has to learn actually what is the opportunity with those staff and how do we adjust the way we work in order to get the maximum benefit from, from those staff and to, to support the patients um, the best we can. Um, so with that, um, across Thurrock, there's been good recruitment of pharmacists. We've now got 16 um, pharmacists in, in posts across the, the primary care networks. And there's just over nine first contact physios uh, who are in post, um, some physician associates, uh, social prescribers, trainee nurse associates. Um, so a broad range of, of staff that are now starting to, to, to work and deliver care for patients within um, the primary care setting uh, in Thurrock. Um, so I guess the kind of key key messages from that front is that um, there is still quite a long way to go in terms of addressing the level of, of underdoctoring, but we started to make a positive start. As an ICB, whilst we obviously cover a mid and south Essex footprint, we will take into account the local context and local needs and that variation in, in that starting point and the fact that Thurrock has got um, a, a particularly challenged situation in terms of GP recruitment and retention um, and therefore we will invest our resources and focus particularly on Thurrock as opposed to trying to just up our overall numbers. Thank, um, sorry Will, I'm, I'm oh, going to interrupt yeah. you there. We've only got two minutes. I've got councillors that would like to ask you a question. Would, Apologies, would, yeah. would that be okay? Thank you. Councillor Rao. Uh, thank you Chair. So, summarise, within a year of becoming the lowest amount of GPs in the country, we've actually gained no GPs that open up a book and a practice. So, I don't see we've made much growth in this at all. I wonder if you can qualify something to me where we come to the fellowship GP in Corinham. How do residents access that GP? Because from what I'm hearing, there's still no change. They still can't get appointments. They get onto a pharmacy on uh, a pharmacist via their doctor, who then misprescribes medication, tells them how to take asthma pumps in the correct uh, incorrect order. I don't see us having the uh, the capability of improving this. I know twelve fellowship GPs. So, sorry, sorry, Councillor Rao. One. Can we get to the the question? Yeah. So we literally so have only got two minutes. So can you break down how residents access? this new fellowship GP in the coronet mine seat? So the, the, the GPs themselves work for um, particular practices. So you would you would contact your GP practice in a normal way and may end up seeing one of the fellows. There is some discussion about them potentially running some other services out of Corringham and, and kind of um, what what that might look like. But their, their kind of main role is within particular general practices um, who, who they're delivering 
primary care services for. So patients would, would contact their, 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 their surgeries in the normal way. Councillor Muldoney. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Will. Uh, it's nice to hear you. I'm so, I, ca I can't actually see you because there's another screen in front of you. I don't know if there's a chance to... Uh, I, I, I've that. tried, sorry. We, oh, we, right, we've okay. been trying to do that right the way through the presentation. Unfortunately, <laughs> all we can see is the top of your head. Yeah. Apologies. Um, but anyway, um, thank you for the update. So can I just clarify where we are in terms of being underdoctored? Because at one point we were the first, third most underdoctored area in the country, then the second, and Councillor Ralph seems to have um, said now that, that we are the most underdoctored area in the country. So could you just clarify which one of those it is? So I would have to, I would have to go back and get those figures. Um, I would work on the basis that, that it is in, in, in the top five of the most underdoctored areas in the country. As far as I'm aware, it's not the most, but obviously top five is, is not a place we want to be. Um, but I would have to go back and get those figures for you because okay. we don't routinely hold them. Well, I think from reading and viewing Stephen Porter's presentation to um, the Health and Wellbeing Overview and Scrutiny Committee, it was the second most underdoctored. Yes. So we'll, yeah. I think that's probably the case. Um, so what I'm hearing is, I mean, I do welcome the initiative about um, recruitment of fellows. Obviously, there is a national shortage of GPs, so whatever we need to look at how we recruit. Um, and it sounds as if that is, it's a good approach that you're taking. So, um, but what I was hearing is that those, the six fellows rather than 10, who are newly qualified GPs and they're in the pipeline, but they haven't started work yet. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So they, they, they at the moment, working with the, the practices who would look to host them um, and finalising uh, contractual details. The, the, the recruitment process itself is an ongoing one. So, so that, that advert will remain open to so any new GPs that are looking um, to qualify in the near future can continue to apply for this scheme. We're not going to close it deliberately to try to get as many people as we can over the coming months and years. Okay, so the um, ambition is still to have 12 and they will work for various practices, but they'll be based at the Corringham. So, so some of their work will, will, will potentially be from Corringham, um, but their, their core general practice work will be with the um, particular general practices across the Thurrock area. Councillor Muldowney, uh, Rita's desperate to come in to answer that question for you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think there's a few key points. Can you turn your mic off, please, Councillor Muldowney? Oh, sorry. So first of all, the commitment is to 12 GP fellows. The second commitment was that we want to see care close to home and therefore the GP fellows, as Will has described, will have a mixed role. So part of their role, and it's to kind of support their portfolio type careers, would actually be, so 50% of that would be primary care appointments. So creating additional capacity in primary care. The other part of their role is to develop specialisms which can be brought back to local communities. And the point that Will made earlier around innovation and training and development, all of that we're trying to bring back locally so that you don't have to be trained back at Basildon Hospital, that some of that training can be done locally. The points around the recruitment, so the total was 12. What we probably need to clarify, and I'll do that with Will um, afterwards, is because we've had... Obviously, 10 people work through that whole recruitment piece. It's the six, where are they in that recruitment piece? And that's the bit I'll work through with Will, and then we'll come back to you on that. Um, and obviously, what we were last advised of is actually that one has been recruited and is ready to start. So we'll get, we, I'll go back to Will and Margaret afterwards, and we'll just get that confirmed and with Leslie Roberts. And where will they be based? So my understanding was that part of the time would be from Corringham Integrated Medical and Wellbeing Centre. So again, I'll check that back with William and Margaret because that was the expectation that whilst their appointments would be booked within their local primary care facility, but that actually the overflow would be back at Corringham IMWC. 
So that's where the actual appointments would be delivered. So I'll work that back with William, Margaret and Leslie, and we'll come back to you. Uh, but you don't know what practice they'll be attached to, what area? So William and Margaret will be able to come back on that point. Okay, so um, the other part of the question that I well, had was how do... How do we're already five minutes over time, so ask, okay, ask your question. It, no, 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 it's honestly... I'll make it as quick as possible. Yeah, ask your question, and, but if I can ask people to just uh, be like, quick about it, that's all I'm asking. Yeah, okay. Um, the other part of my question is how do residents raise concerns about their GP practice, what is the process for them to do so, how can they trigger an inspection, um, who are the people they need to contact, do they go through Health Watch, um, because, you know, uh, as Councillor Rao said, people are having... I like, think we understand the question, can we get to the answer, because we're, we're already over time. So, so very, very, very briefly, so um, in essence, they would... They they would need to go to their GP practice in the first instance to see if the GP the practice can address it. Um, however, if they don't feel it's been sufficiently addressed, there there are a number of options. Health Watch is one through our complaint system within the ICB, and I can share the details of that, or through the Care Quality Commission themselves. Um, and we then triangulate across Health Watch, CQC, and ourselves in terms of what, what's the evidence, what people what, what are people saying, and then who's going to address those issues. But I can share that through Margaret so that you've got the actual. Uh, details of how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything that you wish to add, Will, to round up for us? We'll move on. N no, I, only really commitment from us that that, that that we've obviously made some progress, but there's a, a huge amount still to do, um, and that, that we'll come back and, and update you in terms of, of where we get to with that and work with you in the meantime to try to secure as much capacity in, um, in Thurrock as we can. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for coming to update us today. Moving on to agenda item nine, unpaid carers, all aged carers strategy, a covering report and supporting documents start at page 55 of your papers. 15 minutes has been provided for this item for presentation and Q&A. And I'd like to invite Catherine Wilson to introduce it. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> thank you Chair. Um, this report details um, the outcome. Sorry, could I ask you to just pull your mic forward a bit? There we go, is that better? Excellent. Um, this report details the outcome of an extensive period of engagement with um, young and adult carers, and it mainly focuses on one of the outcomes to develop an action plan and strategy to transform support and services for carers. The, um, the engagement was undertaken by Healthwatch Thurrock, and obviously Kim is here, so she may, at the end, want to just add something about the experiences of that engagement. Um, within the report, we also detail the main activities we're currently undertaking, both operationally and in commissioning, to transform the offer for our unpaid carers. I'm sure that board members are very aware of the importance of carers. Um, and as noted in the report, nationally, one in eight adults, um, which equates to about six million people, um, are carers. And 1.2 million of those provide more than 50 hours of care and support a week. Um, based on, um, on research that's been carried out more recently, Carers UK estimate that throughout the pandemic, an additional 4.5 million people took on caring roles. Um, and we do feel that the numbers may decrease slightly but they will still remain significantly more than the original figure. Um, one in five school children are estimated to be carers, um, and there are a number of, of consequences and impact of that caring role for them. So more likely to have lower educational attainment than their peers as they try to balance the responsibilities that they have um, in their caring role with their schoolwork. Um, one quarter of young carers, as is noted in the report, aged between 11 and 15, do regularly miss school because of that caring role. And one in three young carers state that their caring role makes them feel stressed, um, which I think we would all agree is understandable. Issues, concerns and challenges um, that are experienced both by young carers and adult carers are very similar. 
And the bottom line really is the need and requirement for more support. In Thurrock, it's estimated that we have more than 20,000 people who view themselves as carers, um, and 26% of them um, identify as caring for someone with more than 50 hours a week of support. As with young carers for adults, the caring role um, has significant impacts on their lives, their own well-being, their mental health, employment and educational opportunities as well. We do have a statutory duty through the Care Act and the Children and Family Act, both of 2014, to support carers. So we're now in a position to start the transformation more robustly after the end of the pandemic to carer services. There needs to be a stronger alignment between young carers and adult carers. Um, and it's important because that transition from being a young carer to an adult carer is very significant. The transformation of support is being led by the areas that are identified in Appendix 1. I'm just briefly highlighting some of those. Um, we need to increase the identification of our carers so that we can increase the support and assessments that are available to them. We need to look at co-production of new approaches to carers' assessments. This is some feedback that we have received, received from carers that they're much more strength-based um, um, assessments. We need, need to improve respite opportunities um, to give carers a break. Support to stay in employment and with financial challenges that carers experience. And also the implementation of the portal which enables carers to access information, support and advice. Um, and also for assessments to be undertaken and hopefully for self-assessment options to be made available. And another key area is around transitions and young carers. So we want to develop the carer strategy and an action plan which takes an all age approach. Our existing strategy expired towards the end of the pandemic and so we want to take this opportunity after this very detailed consultation to actually put together um, an action plan and strategic um, approach really based on the voice of carers and their lived experiences. Um, we asked Healthwatch um, Thurrock, as I mentioned at the beginning, to carry out this engagement um, on our behalf. And this was very comprehensive, and the resulting report is embedded in the paper that you have at section eight. The outcome is very detailed, and as you will note, the lived experiences of a wide range of carers is um, recorded within the uh, report very much in their own words, which I think you will agree are very moving at times, the experiences um, that they have. The recommendations for both adults and young carers are um, detailed um, within the report, um, really looking at improving um, a number of areas for people. And if I could find the bit that actually has it on, I could tell you what it is. Um, so um, I think, just bear with me for one moment. Okay, here we are. So at point 3.3, um, we look at the recommendations for both adult carers and for young carers. Um, improving communication, ensuring timely follow-up for referrals into services, better explanations of how assessments take place, um, supporting work with employers to enable carers to maintain employment, um, providing training workshops, for example, um, around uh, various conditions that their loved one may be experiencing and that they're caring for. And also looking at um, advice around lasting power of attorney and guardianship, amongst other things, I haven't mentioned them all. And then for young carers, really looking at working with schools to ensure that young carers can be identified. Again, that there is timely referral into young carers services, that we're able to expand the refer referral pathway um, to enable um, young carers to refer themselves, which is really important, as well as others being able to refer them. And also clearer signposting to pastoral care within um, schools and colleges, again, which is vital. And raising awareness of carers amongst the student population of schools to help young carers um, be identified. But also we, we see in, in the report some experiences of young carers being bullied because of their caring role. So I think it's really important that um, all those areas are highlighted and that's what the report has, has brought out for us. 
So as a result of this engagement, we're proposing to develop an action plan that reflects the reality of caring in Thurrock today, using what the carers see as priority, so that many of those things that I've just mentioned. We're looking to hold an event, which in the report says February, but it's actually going to be on the 20th of March. Um, we're also looking to um, have subsequent meetings um, where we would hope to agree the final action plan, wider consultation, and Health Watch Thurrock have agreed to host a carers reference group as we move forward um, with developing the action plan and the strategy. Um, I don't know, Kim, if there's anything you would just like to add. Thank you, Kathy. Um, it was a really, really long piece of work because we worked with the schools, we spoke to over 300 children, and in that time we identified quite a few that hadn't, weren't known to the schools that they were young carers. They hadn't sort of put themselves forward. Um, there was lots of issues with the children around not being allowed to have their phones in class, and for them it was a big thing, especially if they had their phones removed. So it was really quite upsetting when you spoke to some of these children. We found some safeguarding issues which we raised straight away, and there was a couple of points within all of this where we didn't wait for the report, we just took them straight to Catherine and, and to various people with the concerns. So the young people are really desperate to be involved in planning and looking at what they actually want and what they actually need to help them. Um, we've done a lot of work with um, working carers, so that was sort of evening work really because of their work. And some of the issues that they were raising were the same sort of things like taking phone calls at work, especially for health issues, um, which didn't always, but especially if they worked in shops and shop floors, things like that, where they couldn't have their phone with them and no idea of when a GP would call them. So there was all, it spreads across everything. We, we done eight um, videos which are embedded in the report but are accessible on our website. And some of those were, some of them are hard watching. But it was things that needed to be said and shared. So we've got a young man on there, Glenn. I can say his name because he's on there and identifies himself. Who was a young carer to a very um, complexly ill brother who passed away when he was a teenager. And as an adult, he's become a carer for his grandmother. And the things that he brought out in there it was spread out into social media and everything. He wanted it done. And the amount of people that have responded that have said, as parents, it's going to make them look really differently at the siblings of a child with a disability. Because it, it really is quite heart-wrenching. And he also went and spoke to a lot of the young carers for us about how they need to speak up now and not carry it until they're adults when it becomes an issue for them. So it, it was a very, very big piece of work. We use the coalition... Um, the user-led organisation, they helped as well with bringing lots of people forward who care for people with disabilities. There was a lot of issues around carers of people with drug and alcohol issues that trying to get them some support, which is quite a specific piece of support. So all of that has gone in. And as, as um, Catherine has said, we've got this event where some of those people are going to come along and speak, but where there's an opportunity for everybody to get together to provide a better service. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a subject that really we could give the whole day to, and I know and it's vital. Um, we are running probably about 10 minutes late, but I'm going to allow us to run 10 minutes late if everybody's happy with that. Um, yeah, I'll put you on the list for a question. Um, thank you. I, I, I was really pleased, actually, that you, you gave us that bit of information because um, I, I was looking at the report on page 49, knowing child carers are often missing school or, or they're struggling with time management because they've got so much more on their plate. I was surprised not to see anything about help with homework or catch-up classes mentioned um, under young carer recommendations. And I, I definitely see the merits of a joint strategy, but when I got to page 62 onwards through the appendix, I found myself saying, what about the children? What about the children? Because I, I couldn't see them in there. And I was concerned that they might get lost and we might lose sight of them within a joint strategy. But I know you're going to make sure we don't, which is great. Um, and uh, it, it was around like, 
for instance, it, it said that we're implementing a portal for adults to access more support care, and yet children are so computer literate today, and that they didn't get a mention there. So it was just making sure that there's, you know, equal focus in there for me. Councillor Ralph, you were first with question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for this report. I was lucky enough a few months ago to meet a group of young carers. Um, and when they do meet up, they do swap WhatsApp numbers and phone numbers and they, they do this little support network themselves. I think what I learned from them was the ambition that they had to pass on their knowledge to other people of what they're going through. And also that the, the support network they'd like to have while they're doing exams because they're really struggling. They want to do their exams because they're ambition. They want to do stuff. Um, and I'd just like, if there's something that could be worked around in that help of that study buddies or something like that, because they really want to qualify and get their qualifications. But thank you for the report. Uh, either of you, if you want to come back. I think you're absolutely right. And they do, um, they do join forces as such. And, and they do tend to support each other within schools, those that are known, mainly because the um, care and support that's put in for them, especially across academies, they have one person that covers all of the schools. So they can go weeks without seeing that person, but they really buzzy up. And we've got a couple that really speak out and they've actually joined a group and they've identified work with our young, other young Health Watch ambassadors around pieces of work that they want to see be seen about bullying and about drug and alcohol use in young people and why they're doing it. And it's quite, it seems quite prolific within those that are young carers. From their own, that's what they're telling us, that's what they do. They start smoking, they drink, they act, because they've not got an adult around to actually stop them. So they meet up and do that and that's their release. And if you think they're really quite young to be looking at that as a way out, but they have asked us if we can do, if they can lead on a piece of work with other young people, which we're absolutely facilitating for them. Thank you. Catherine, you want to add in? No? Yes, thank you. And just by way of reassurance um, around not losing sight of young people, um, we have an integrated approach to this now. We have one, one officer who is um, going to undertake the commissioning work around both children, young people and adults and ensure that the strategic approach and the action plan details everything and it's been really helpful to have those comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Aldoni. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I really welcome this strategy and it's an integrated strategy um, and I particularly welcome the measures for children. I mean, it's heartbreaking reading the statistics there of how, how um, this caring activity that these children have undertaken at sometimes incredibly young ages um, that is saving society, you know, providing so much social and economic value to society um, and that, you know, they're largely, most of them we don't even know about, you know, so I really welcome um, this piece of work um, which is looking at identifying and providing support for um, the carers. I was just looking at the part of the strategy where it talks about um, a more targeted action plan rather than, you know, having to, to go into a large strategy document. And I do actually welcome that as well. Um, the nearer we can be to actually providing a difference for people on the ground, the better. Um, and although I accept that we do need overarching strategies for sort of bigger pieces of work, it's nice to hear that this is actually going to have some um, impact as soon as the February half term, which is next week. So uh, I really welcome that. I really congratulate you on your piece of work, both Health Watch and the others who've been involved in it, um, and look forward to hearing an update in the future. Thank you. Thank you. It, uh, I, it, I think we echo those words. It, it, it's excellent to see and it's so vital. And I think we, we mustn't lose sight of for young children when they're growing up in that environment and it's their normal, 
they won't necessarily recognise that they're carers, that because this is just how their life is. And, and so it's vital that we, you can catch them like you're doing, so it's excellent. It's recommended that the board notes the findings of the unpaid carers consultation and agrees the proposed approach to strategy and action plan development. Are members content to approve recommendations? I, I think that was a foregone conclusion, but great, thank you. Moving on to agenda item 10, Mid-South Essex Integrated Care Strategy. Um, provided on page 67 of your papers. We've got 20 minutes have been provided for this item, consisting of 10 minute presentation, 10 minutes Q&A, and I'd like to invite Jeff Banks to introduce it. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to pre present uh, this strategy. Uh, my name is Jeff Banks, and I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships for the Mid and South Essex Integrated Care System. Um, and what I'm going to do today is just talk through the strategy and thank you, Chair, for allowing me to, to offer some slides to help illustrate the strategy, to help members understand the broad thrust uh, and scope of the strategy that's being presented today. Um, so just first to say uh, my thanks to uh, you, Chair, for your support with the uh, process of developing this strategy. We're very grateful for it. We had a very delightful afternoon at Averley Community Hub, and thank you for co-hosting one of the workshops that we did with community members. But also my thanks to uh, Les Billingham and Joe Broadbent, and also Ian Wake, who've supported the steering group for this strategy, uh, and we're really grateful for their contribution to, to it as well. Um, before I kick off uh, and dive into it, just to say that as part of the process of developing this strategy, um, we reviewed 27 um, publicly available documents, and in particular, um, in Thurrock, we were really pleased to review um, the Thurrock um, uh, Health and Wellbeing Strategy, which was refreshed in 2022, and also the very um, excellent Better uh, Care Together case for further change. And I hope members will re recognise the influence that some of that work has had in the development of this strategy, because you will find common themes and common language that we use. Uh, and in particular, we're really grateful uh, for the information about the Thurrock Integrated Care Alliance and without um, wandering too much into flattery, the, the way you've been working over a number of years in Thurrock, uh, bringing together the different partners has had influence on the way we're developing the integrated care system and the integrated care partnership particularly. So my thanks for that. Um, you'll be pleased to see that at the, uh, at the heart of the strategy, as is um, mentioned on this first slide, is a common endeavour. And we use the phrase common endeavour because it reflects that it is a piece of work to do. It is something that we will come together to do. Uh, and the strategy covers a 10 year period, recognising that there's some real ambitious change that we're wanting to see in our new partnership way of working across health and care in Mid and South Essex. Um, again, resonating with many of the themes that have been discussed today, you'll see at the, the front and centre of this strategy is the desire to reduce inequalities together. The common endeavour expresses our desire to work together collaboratively to um, eliminate avoidable health and care inequalities, creating a broad and equal partnership of individuals, organisations and agencies, local community groups, voluntary community sector organisations, focusing on prevention and early intervention and providing high quality joined up care and health services when and where people need them. So that sits at the absolute centre of what we are seeking to do together. And again, in our review of the 27 strategies, we distilled it down, and really that is the one thing that binds all of the strategies of all of our health and care partners together. And so it sits at the heart of our strategy. Um, next slide, please. Um, you'll see um, as part of the strategy on page um, 87 of your report, we present the overarching strategy effectively as a plan on the page. And this shows it, uh, it's variously described as an onion or a wheel. But you see in the, in the center of this, um, uh, uh, this diagram, we have that common endeavor. And then we identify what the partner priorities are, so how they respond to this. Our community priorities, what we learned from our conversations with community members, over 1,700 community members who are engaged in this process. Um, also our system priorities, in that what, what is the system seeking to tackle and how will it contribute to this common endeavor. And then around the outside, you'll see what is effectively the agenda for the integrated care partnership itself, the things that will be regularly reviewed and, and exercise um, the uh, integrated care partnership as it moves forward. 
Um, on to the next slide. At the centre of our strategy um, is the partner priorities. And you'll be pleased to see that this is um, uh, described in the strategy as the north, south, east and west of our priorities. And at the north is um, our attention on the wider determinants of health, which responds very clearly to the work that you've developed here, and particularly as recognising your own strategy. Um, we have to recognise that um, uh, health and care services will only ever play a small part. And actually, if we don't tackle the many wider determinants of health, um, uh, harnessing all the talents and expertise of our many varied partners, then we will never do that well together. In effect, we'll be um, doing Einstein's theory of uh, insanity, of doing the same things over and over again and expecting a different outcome. So we have to work differently. Um, also in this, uh, uh, um, this uh, priorities here, uh, at the south is core 20 plus five. And core 20 plus five is the NHS or the health priorities that particularly focus around on health inequality. And there's links to those documents in the strategy. And interestingly, when we talk about core 20 plus five, that's the core 20, the 20% 20 most deprived communities, those plus groups which we identify as being particularly of uh, disadvantaged in our local communities, and then the five key clinical priorities. We tend to think about adults, but uh, members will be pleased to hear that there was a children and young people's um, core 20 plus five published in October, and we need to make sure um, uh, the chair, as you said in the previous item, that we uh, make sure we're attending to the needs of children and young people and, and the particular challenges that they present. Um, and then in the east and west, um, again, responding particularly to local authorities' priorities. So we've got babies, children and young people. So recognising that babies and children and young people are both human beings in their own right who deserve access to superb health and care services but also they are adults of the future. And many of the inter early intervention and prevention activities that we might do will be best, best done by children, with children, um, because many of the long-term adult health conditions that we're dealing with are actually seeded in childhood. So if we can tackle obesity, encourage healthy living, healthy lifestyles, healthy eating, um, it can be a really positive contribution to preventing those long-term adult uh, conditions as they develop later in life. And then finally, adult care, and we're particularly here looking at the ageing population, but also mental health, suicide prevention, uh, and work um, around adults with learning disabilities and autism, and particularly high-intensity users, those very small group of, of uh, adults who place a really huge demand on services. What are those experiences like, and how can we ensure that we're supporting those adults? So I'll rattle through the next couple of slides quite quickly, if that's OK. So on the next slide... Um, you've got a, a, a diagram representing the um, wider determinants of health. And you'll see in the, in the green um, uh, circles there that access to care and quality of care is recognised as only actually offering 20% of the overall contribution to the improvements on population health outcomes that we want to see. In many ways, far more important are healthy behaviours, healthy lifestyles, the sorts of things that Joe and a fabulous team in, in public health are working on day in and day out, socioeconomic factors in terms of education, income, employment, housing, family support, community safety, etc., and also the environment. So the quality of the environment and, and the built environment, how that contributes to health. On the next slide, uh, I'll just uh, flash through these quickly. So that's the adult core 20 plus five model. And you see along the bottom there, you know, the maternity, severe mental illness, chronic respiratory disease, et cetera, those key priorities that we have uh, as, a, as a health system. And then the next one is the uh, uh, babies, children, and young people's core 20 plus five, uh, which has much brighter colors, which I quite like. Um, it was really important on the next slide that we actually took measure of the community's priorities. What did they want for our integrated care system? And, and in fact, these uh, key themes came up time and time again, uh, Chair, in those workshops that you attended and the many others. Uh, access, again, making sure that we approve and develop access and take, um, take heed of the community's desires and, and the concerns that they have. Awareness, um, community members expressed that they wanted to know what services were available when and where, and they didn't feel they had ready and sufficient access uh, to that sort of knowledge. There was a real clear message about responsibility. Um, so community members saying, we will stand up and be part of the solution here. We don't expect services to do everything. We can't expect there to be a service that rises up to meet every unmet need. That's unrealistic, so let us do some of the work. Um, openness and involvement were also key themes. 
And on the system priorities, which is the next slide, you'll recognize many of these and be concerned about them yourselves, members. So recognizing the, uh, the real challenges and pressures on our systems, particularly in primary care uh, uh, and acute care. Um, also workforce measures, and again, you've been discussing and exercising your concerns about that very uh, clearly today, ensuring that we have a one workforce approach, recognizing the unintended consequences. If one part of our system improves conditions and terms for uh, health and care colleagues, does it then sap those, um, uh, those other parts of the system that, that haven't responded in the same way? Early intervention and prevention, the age-old dilemma of how do, we f how do we spend tomorrow's savings today? So ensuring that we invest in early, inter early intervention and prevention to stave off the downstream pressures that come later. A connected care, we will work tirelessly to ensure that all of our health and care offers are both in the public, private and third sector are well connected, integrated and that there are clear pathways and routes through um, the various services that people might need to have access to. And then the age old problem again of shared records and data. So again, we'll work tirelessly to ensure that we're not asking the same questions over and over again, that we do have access to good quality shared records when and where we need it, recognizing that members of the public, our community members do also have a right to have privacy, et cetera. Um, and so on the final one, and I won't talk about these too much, but this is just to mention some of the key priorities, the shape and form of our partnership. So what we're going to do together and when and where, our ways of working, uh, our desire to act together and those things where we will work together as one and our shared goals and learning. Um, we will never um, seek to undermine the sovereign uh, independence of the individual organisations that form this partnership or the local authorities, but we will just ensure that where we are able to have better impact working together, we will commit ourselves to doing so, and that's really key. And finally, just on the last slide here, um, I just wanted to show this, uh, end with a picture. Um, we're not aiming in the integrated care system in Mid and South Essex to have a neatly mowed lawn, a single uniform monoculture, but rather a rich wildflower meadow of services and offers which better meet the needs of clients uh, and citizens, which together form a united, unified whole. But we have to bear in mind that a wildflower meadow is not created, members, simply by the absence of gardening. Um, we have to work together tirelessly to create the circumstances and the environment where each of the constituent parts is able to thrive and contribute to the wider picture. And that's what we're uh, concerned to do here. We'd be um, just, uh, the, the, you have a draft strategy in front of you today, members. It will go to the Integrated Care Partnership on the 20th of March, so next month. Uh, as it is a draft strategy, there is still the opportunity for influence and involvement, and if you have any comments or observations, uh, both now in today's meeting or afterwards, please do contact me and my, um, my contact details on the final slide. Thank you, members. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I, I welcome you joining our meeting, and it would be nice if you can join us so that we can show that we really like connecting up and across and down and through. Um, at the workshop, um, Jeff ran an exercise where he put a toy rabbit in the middle of the room, and if you agreed with his statement, you stood close to the rabbit, and if you didn't, you moved further away to where you felt you needed to be. And the statement you made at that time was, we are good at community engagement. And I actually walked out of the room, shut the door and stood the other side of the door. So I think we, we both knew what page we were on then. So it won't be any surprise to you that my question is around that. Community engagement, as we know, is easier said than done. So we definitely need to help each other across the different partnership disciplines to start to broaden our reach and draw on the vast amount of knowledge and experience that we all do have. How do you see this working? And as before, how do you see quality and health assessments being embedded across decision making? And how can we strengthen them? And instead, this follows on from what you were saying, Councillor Mordoni. I, I wrote it a couple of times, actually. Instead of saying it's likely to be detrimental to equality or to health, how can we start to quantify that properly? 
Thank you, Chair, and it was, it was great fun to work with you in that workshop, and uh, it was, we, we asked about a dozen or so questions, and it was really fascinating to see people physically respond rather than just sit down with pen and paper and, and do response in that way. It was really helpful. I think the engagement of community members is absolutely front and centre. Uh, the strategy you see really clearly describes that this is not a partnership just between uh, organisations and agencies. This has to be a partnership between organisations and agencies and residents because actually we cannot do this on our own and we have to um, uh, ignite the enthusiasm, light the blue touch paper of our community so they actually see that they have a role in it. Uh, and it, you know, it, for every uh, service that we might offer, there are probably a dozen community uh, groups and organizations, formal and informal, who would be able to contribute and support the kinds of outcomes we want to see. So, Chair and members, you will see that engagement, positive, active engagement with community members will be a feature of the work of the Integrated Care Partnership throughout its life, not just something we do now at the beginning and then return to every, every now and then when we want to review. It will be a common feature. And we mentioned in the strategy that there will be a series of workshops, uh, uh, engagement opportunities, report backs, throughout the lifespan of the strategy, and that's how we'll seek to try and build this new partnership, a new relationship with community members. We can't do it without them, put simply. In terms of how we uh, uh, assess what we're doing, um, we'll be presenting for the 20th of March meeting an outcomes framework. You'll see that in the strategy, we define a series of I and we statements, which articulate what we want to do, but we'll have an outcomes framework, and that will dovetail in to the other outcomes frameworks we have for example, uh, Jo Broadbent and her team, uh, their excellent work that they do on population health management, ensuring that we really have a rigorous and solid data platform which helps us understand precisely where we should be working and when. But actually, um, I'd, I'd, I'd pick up on a point that Les uh, Billingham made earlier in the meeting about stories, uh, because you'll see in the strategy we say that stories are data with soul. And actually, if we don't hear the stories of individuals and only look at metrics in terms of numbers, we'll never actually fully get to the heart of how people are experiencing services. So there'll be an ongoing commitment, Chair, to that. Thank you, Joe. Did you want to come in there? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the discussion earlier around the, you know, quantifying the impact of Domain 2 and also the question around how do we measure the impact of community engagement. I think it's actually really hard to do at a local level like we are in Thurrock. But there is a really strong evidence base that people who are active in their communities, people who are engaged in their communities, uh, and there's even evidence that people who have health conditions but are volunteers, their health improves and their outcomes in terms of quite uh, you know, measurable outcomes like mortality is actually improved by the act of volunteering and supporting others. So I think in terms of us monitoring the impact, it's going to be hard to do at a community level. But as long as we, perhaps what we need to do is be clear that this is what the evidence says. And so this is why we're recommending volunteering. <coughs> this is why being engaged and active in your community is important. So if we measure those activities, it's a proxy for the health outcome, if, if that makes sense. Thank you. Councillor Mordoni. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I welcome this sort of overarching strategy. I think you've done a good job of actually setting out the challenge, which is obviously that demand is far outstripping capacity. Um, and that's not just happened recently, that's been happening for at least a decade, um, both in funding of the NHS, but also funding of local authorities. And we've got additional problems that have been brought by COVID in terms of waiting lists and obviously that the funding that we have got at the moment is focused on dealing with people who are already sick you know and acute care so um, I'm glad that that piece was actually recognized and acknowledged because we need to start from a, a base of reality really um, I thought it was quite interesting, this idea of the first 5,000 families. Uh, I think that's good to have identified and expressed um, as kind of the first achievable step, if you like. Um, but when I looked at what impact that has, that's sort of like 
4% of the total population w that you're looking at, which is about 1.2 million, isn't it? So um, I understand you have to start somewhere, but it, it, we're still at the drop in the ocean. Um, but I think we do need to do it. We do need to take that first step towards funding preventative measures rather than it all going down the black hole of, um, you know, acute interventions, which obviously cost a lot more. Um, it will be interesting to see how it develops and how you bring it forward, and I look forward to your update. Thank you. Chair, thank just you. very quickly on that, thank you. Um, that's a re that's a really helpful comments, and thank you for your appreciation of the process and the strategies we've presented. That's, that's really helpful. Um, I, I think in relation to the challenge about how we commit more resource into uh, early intervention and prevention, I think um, the analogy that's often used is that we spend so much time pulling people out of the river that we forget to go upstream and work out why they're falling in. Now, the problem that often happens with services in both health and care is that we expect that the people who are experts in pulling people out the river should stop doing that, run upstream and stop people falling in river. But actually, there are different people that should be involved in this. So our voluntary community sector partners, local authorities, they are superb at actually knowing their communities. And so in a way, let's get the people who are experts to do the right pieces of work. So I think a broader and more inclusive in partnership that embraces uh, communities, voluntary sector, faith organizations, informal and formal associations of groups is probably actually uh, one way that we can begin to tackle the long-term pressures on our systems by actually encouraging everybody to be part of making our communities healthier. And, and I have to say your own strategy absolutely focuses in on that and recognizes that. So I think it's important, uh, Councillor, that we are, as we say in the strategy, is that we not only commit ourselves to doing things differently, but that we also commit ourselves to doing different things. We have to have the confidence, actually, just to try things out that we haven't done before, to, to try things, to engage new groups and organisations, to work rapidly, to test and learn new ways of doing things, because uh, we have been at this for a good many years, uh, and uh, we're not going to address these new challenges and the, the age-old long-term long challenges without a radical new way of tackling things, and I think that's best done as a partnership, uh, rather than simply saying that our health or social care agencies should take all of the weight of that. Let's spread it amongst a broader partnership. Thank you. Councillor Ralph? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for this report. Um, I was quite chuffed to see so much of our strategy in it. So, welcome aboard. So, um, but again, it was about community engagement. We do have groups like the food banks that are now identifying families that are in need. So it's just how wide a scope we're going to go to to do that community engagement. We're looking at more uh, local events that are engaging. I don't know how you plan to do that as well. Thank you. Um, we will establish a, a, a range of new forums. Um, so we have a community assembly that we're establishing, a private and providers, a pri private and independent providers network. Um, but also, most importantly, we're not going to reinvent the, the wheel, councillor, because there are many groups doing fantastic engagement work, our health watch organisations particularly, and let's not redo all of that. So let's collect together the community voices, the experiences, um, rather than trying to redo everything. So let's lean on our colleagues who are experts in doing that work, and I think that's the right way. But there will be new opportunities, and we will seek to have an ongoing conversation with communities. Um, because one of the things that most surprising is the, the, the language that we're comfortable with in these rooms and rooms like them is not the language which residents understand. Uh, they don't know the difference between the Integrated Care Partnership and Integrated Care Board, uh, the health organisations, social care, and nor should they in some respects. What they just want to know is that are they having an opportunity to have their say, to be listened to, but more importantly, it's not just about voice, it's about voice and hands. Are we giving communities the opportunity to roll their sleeves up and get involved and do things? Are we supporting them? Are we standing back to let them be part of the change they want to see? And that's why engagement will sit at the heart of this work, councillor. It's really key.
Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. It's um, the integrated care partnership where everybody's in the room and we're, we're all talking these things and it's it often, like I'm in there, don't reinvent the wheel, I keep saying, why aren't you using each other? And, and it is actually underneath, it's fairy steps because it's, it's new, but it is happening at local base level. We see that with the integrated medical centre, we, we, we see it across community and engagement. And um, it's just cementing that and building on it so and getting focused. Because Jeff and I have had conversations about, you know, the NHS are fantastic at firefighting. We need to leave them firefighting. They haven't got the time to look back at the rest of us and the primary and preventative care. But local authorities are really good at that. So why, why aren't we using each other more? The police, you're, you're that front line as well with preventative care often. We, we've got to start using each other correctly and, and sharing that alliance budget. One thing I will say that maybe you don't know is that the Integrated Care Board um, meetings, they are public meetings in the same way the council is a public meeting. You can look up the agenda. In fact, Jeff, perhaps we can get everybody on the board linked into making sure they know when the next meeting is, what's on the agenda. Because as a member of the public, I sat there, but you can, on a time scale like council, put in a question and hold them to account and, uh, and ask those difficult questions in front of the, the board that sits above the board that sits above us. <laughs> So it's recommended that members approve the integrated care strategy and offers observations about how work is taken forward as appropriate, endorses initial areas for joint working with the integrated care partnership. Are members content to approve the recommendations? Yes, thank you, Jeff, and thank you for your time today. Uh, moving on to agenda item 11, I'm, I'm sorry you've, you've had a long wait for this. Suicide prevention across Southend, Essex and Borough, provided on page 115 of your papers. 20 minutes has been provided for this item, consisting of a 10-minute presentation and 10 minutes Q&A. And I'd like to invite Jane Gardner and Maria Payne to introduce it. Thank you. If you turn Jeff's on and repoint the microphone, we'll be able to hear you. We just won't see you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, members as well. Uh, absolutely delighted. Jane Gardner, Deputy Police Fire and Crime Commissioner for Essex, but um, here in my capacity as a chairperson for the South End Essex and Thurrock uh, Suicide Prevention Board. Um, so a uh, really important topic for me and just hearing... Uh, the, the conversation around the room since I've joined uh, a really important topic for, for you too and thank you Jeff for including it in your uh, in your stra strategy um, so uh, I chair that board uh, what I'm going to do uh, is assume that you've read the paper I'm sure that you have but I was going to ask Maria just to say a few words by way of introducing some of the figures and then I'll come in at the end just to to do a, a mop-up and, and a summary if that's okay chair Lovely, thank you. Rescue's coming. <laughs> Somebody may have forgotten the battery. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me with this on? Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so just picking up from what uh, Jane said, I'm just going to um, draw your attention to some of the work that's provided in the paper, um, a little bit about the data and information, um, but also about the work that's been going on, because I'm conscious that I believe the last time I presented uh, an update to Health and Wellbeing Board here, was definitely um, prior to the pandemic, so we're talking at least three years ago. Um, you'll hopefully see from the paper there's quite a lot that has changed um, since then in terms of the work that we've been doing. Um, but the first point that I do want to just make in here um, is just the um, reiteration of the public or published data um, on suicides. 
Um, you'll see that um, on point 2.3 in the report. Um, what you will see is that for Thurrock, um, we have a significantly lower rate of suicides here um, than the national average. Um, but I also want to point out that that doesn't tell the whole story. There are some caveats with that, which um, I've listed uh, in the paper as well. Um, the rate that is sort of, um, published in there, it equates to 26 deaths um, that were categorized in that way over a three year period. However, to supplement uh, that information, what we have learned, what we know now, um, since that, sort of that information has been published, we now have access to some near real-time suicide surveillance uh, data. It's um, abbreviated sometimes to RTSS, uh, which is data that is collected um, in the main by Essex Police and sometimes by the British Transport Police um, when they come out to um, incidents on scene. They report information and that information is now sort of coming through um, on a monthly basis to the three um, public health leads, so one of, of which is myself, um, for South End, Essex and Thurrock, um, bearing in mind that the Essex Police Geography covers all three authority areas. So on a month-by-month -month basis, we have uh, more regular insight um, and a bit more information about um, the characteristics and a bit more about sort of the circumstances. And that's been really um, insightful about um, how we can actually direct our preventative approach. Um, as you'll see, you know, the, the rate that was published or just relying on those figures doesn't tell the whole story. So this is much more real-time local information. Um, there are very strict um, information sharing protocols around that primarily due to the small numbers uh, involved. Um, you will see I have um, referenced in this report the number um, across South End, Essex and Thurrock um, in the financial year 21-22 was 129. Obviously some of those were Thurrock. I can't say the number in a public meeting, but it was reasonably low. <coughs> um, but what it does tell us um, is sort of the characteristics and a bit about who was in contact with services as well as the data, we've also um, been in receipt of some WAVE transformation monies um, directed specifically for suicide prevention across Mid and South Essex. So over the three year period between April 2020 and March 2020, well it's coming to the end of 23. Um, this year there are a number of things we have done which are listed in the paper under point 3.1. Um, just to draw members' attention to some of the um, points that are listed um, in here, because I want to clarify that this work has been done very much in partnership, um, recognising the point you were making earlier about um, how significant um, a role that we can play as local authorities, as police, um, you know, as general partners um, in this agenda. That reflects um, the groups um, and organisations that have been around the table to do all of this. Um, but to draw attention to some highlights uh, within there, um, we've rolled out a very successful program of training around suicide prevention. There have been a number of different types, um, uh, focuses around that training, um, some of which has been to primary care clinicians. So we trained um, 211 um, of our GPs and practice staff across Mid and South Essex in particular sort of techniques around um, being aware of suicide, um, looking at risk, how to record information, how to have conversations with people who are very vulnerable. Um, we trained over 400 um, other frontline professionals and workers in the community. Um, and just to highlight, you know, 90 of those came from the probation service, for example. 35 of them were actually employees of Thurrock Council. So if you think out of that 400, actually, that's, I think that's quite a good proportion. Um, and many others from across the voluntary sector, um, some charities um, across the patch. Um, we've also um, put some of that money into a community fund, so recognising um, the, you know, the very important and key role um, that those organisations can have. So we funded seven projects across Mid and South Essex um, over the last year that are still, many of which are still running, um, that are doing work specifically around suicide prevention. 
Um, and the other thing to particularly highlight, because this has received national recognition, is the rollout of the um, Wellbeing Calls Pathway, um, which has been delivered um, for, within Thurrock by Thurrock and Brentwood Mind, um, which essentially supports people who are newly diagnosed with depression um, to basically have offer to a bit more support whilst they're potentially waiting for something else to um, kick in, whether that is um, their prescription medication, whether that is IAPT, whether that is something else. Um, but that has been picked up and recognised as a national success. Um, and that came from an idea that we had locally. Um, they, it's, it's also resulted in some extra work um, looking sort of at, at our systems. So to look at how um, we can increase referrals into that programme. We're working with our um, Mid and South Essex ICB colleagues about um, how we can sustain some of this work because appreciating that the way through funding um, was sort of time limited, I've mentioned it only rolls until March, but we're in discussions at the moment about what we can continue recognising the impact um, that some of it's had. And we've, we have and plan to evaluate um, the particular success of these as well. Um, the final point I'm just going to make uh, before I hand over to Jane um, is just about some of the particular um, other links that we're making. Um, so there's the activity that so I've touched on already that we've done, but the connections that we're also making at a Thurrock level with the Thurrock Safeguarding Adults Board, um, our Mental Health Transformation Board that we have um, in existence and our Integrated Emotional Wellbeing Partnership for Children and Young People. I just want to um, reiterate that um, to colleagues here because I appreciate I've talked about um, programmes that have, um, some of which have been at South End Essex and Thurrock level, some of which have been mid, mid and South Essex level. So I just want to reiterate the Thurrock um, emphasis and leadership that we've got into these programmes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, and I, and I should say uh, thank you to Thurrock um, for, um, for, to you members and to, to Joe for um, the work that Maria is doing in this space, that absolutely exceptional support, uh, so really very grateful to you. Um, so I'm a person that likes action, um, and I like action to be driven by evidence. So RTSS is really important to us in terms of the information that gives us and how we can direct our, our, our small resource to actually prevent suicide going forward. And, 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 and I say that with some hesitation because I think we need to stem the numbers and then start our prevention journey. It's, it's a really complex area and I've learned so much since work, working with our public health colleagues on this. So a, a lot to do there and nationally, this is of course also being looked at and we know a suicide prevention strategy will come sometime in 2023, which, which is good and interesting and obviously our partnership will need to flex and respond to that, but, but we are all very keen and very committed to doing something now locally. So in the paper at 3.6, you'll see a, a, a lot of um, different areas which we've already begun to start work on a, on a huge number of those uh, to, to make the links and to think with other strategic partners about what more we can do in that space um, to prevent suicide going forward. Of course, it will, will not be lost on any of you the uh, cost of living crisis that we're in at this time. And what we do know as well is in 2010 when we were in a similar position um, suicide rates increased. So, you know, it's about being mindful, being proactive about what more we can do to support people who are, are, are struggling in, in those circumstances. So, you know, having DWP colleagues on the partnership and a range of other people on the partnership really helps us think through in broadest terms about what more we can and should be doing in, in this space. Um, I want to just mention postvention support for those bereaved individuals. Previously, there was a very, very generic service provided. And, you know, if, if you've been in contact with anybody, families, friends, loved ones that have experienced suicide, you need some very specific specialist support in this space. So we will be launching 
uh, over the coming months a very tailored specific bereavement uh, a service to those who have experienced suicide uh, within that family context. So um, we're, we're very sure that that will be very, very welcome going forward. Um, so wh why are we here today? Um, well, I, I just think you're a really important body. Uh, health and wellbeing boards are really important uh, across uh, Greater Essex. Uh, I wanted the opportunity absolutely to, to network this with you, to inform you, to, to tell you what we're doing, to tell you there is more to come and just secure your commitment to us coming back at the time when, it, when we have got more to say and we have got greater asks to make of you. Um, currently, one of the things we are exploring is the RTSS um, uh, information that we collect. It's largely police at the moment, uh, which, which is not a bad thing, but we want to, to grow that so we get a greater understanding about what's happening uh, across our communities. So uh, that's one of the things we're, we're just working through and we'll be coming back with, with an ask. I'm not here today for money. What I'm here today for is to say, can you commit again I know you're committed, but again, we haven't been here for a while. Can you c continue to commit to this agenda and work with us uh, in that partnership to, to make the difference, as, as Jeff said, that we all want to see? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And uh, actually, you answered my, my question there of um, sort of having been close to an experience, understanding the vulnerability of those loved ones that are dealing with that. And so it was really great to hear that you're extending that piece of work because you understand that's a very unique kind of support that's needed. Um, I just wanted to say as well, uh, it can sound very clinical in a room like this when you're discussing figures, but it is very human. Sorry. And um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that as, as police, you deal with it in such an amazing way. And it must be so traumatic for you as well. Th thank you, thank you. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry that you're upset, but I, as you say, it's a very human reaction. Um, and uh, police and other colleagues, not just police, uh, deal with these incidents with the greatest of compassion uh, and also to reassure people that we make sure that they get the support they need of having dealt with them because it's as tra it can be traumatic for them too. Um, but but that your comments are really kind, thank you, and I'll make sure that they go back. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ralph. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, perhaps I should have declared at the beginning that obviously I've been a mental health tutor for 20 years. Um, I see both sides of this. I mean, I would love to have a positive wellbeing strategy. Um, I know also your work has just been fantastic over, I mean, I think it was three years ago you presented in front of me, and you no, know, I see the impact on there. I also take on board the, the, the numbers are tricky to work out. Um, also, that obviously, if someone may take their own life outside of the borough, they may not be recorded as a suicide here. So we have to take a lot of that on board. Um, I just want to thank you for the work, I mean, you know, it's, it's a horrible subject. And I do, uh, go back to the emphasis of positive well-being. You know, the more work we can do on that side of it, it's, it's not the firefighting. We're getting to the core of it. And you know, I hope you do get a commitment from us. We, you can see the passion that we have behind it. So I just want to thank you both for the report and uh, the work that you're doing as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Ralph. And I can only echo what you say about Maria's work. It's been exceptional, so thank you. Liz, you want to ask a question? Yeah, um, thanks again. Uh, you know, I echo what everyone said. It's, it's a really important um, area and, and we're doing some really good work in it. One thing I, I wasn't sure about, there's no ages mentioned in this. Is this across the board? Is this an all-age study or is it only adults? It, it's, it's a really interesting question. So um, when the wave funding, if, if Maria will kick me under the table if I get this wrong, but... Uh, I found it fascinating. When the wave funding was first introduced, it was very focused on middle-aged men. But we, since we've had RTSS running, and with the year's worth of data we've had, it, it's really interesting because, yes, of course, it is middle-aged men. It's largely males, but across that male spectrum, it's, it's a real spread, including young people, which, you know, uh, 
that can't be right, can it? We, we can't see that in our society today where young people, that is the choice that they have to make. So it's a, it's a real spread. Uh, and and I, I could go on, but I probably won't. Um, but So we are looking across the age range and not just focused on a, a specific core group now. Sorry, just to add to the point, um, with some of the programmes that we've talked about, obviously, um, as Jane said, the funding was originally meant to be targeted towards middle-aged men, but that's not a, it's not the only inclusion criteria for some of those programmes. So the wellbeing course, for example, it's not restricted um, to that cohort. Um, the training um, wasn't restricted to professionals that only work with that cohort at all, because it's recognising that we need to... Um, work on prevention across all ages. The membership of the SEP suicide prevention steering group um, has people from organisations that support from cradle to grave. So it is um, all age in that, in that respect. Just to say, because some of the um, causal relationships are different, aren't they? There's a lot of online stuff that's particularly concerning with young people. So presumably, um, there are different ways of responding to different age groups um, and different influences. Okay, thank you. Jeff, you wanted to ask a question? I'll grab a microphone from somewhere. Um, <laughs> thank you, Chair. I, I did just want to uh, I really genuinely welcome the report. It's really helpful and some really fabulous work that's happening there. And I just wanted to mention that this is probably a case point in an example of a health and care sector where we have to recognise services can only do so much. It's the responsibility of all of us, actually. Um, the prevention of suicide is not something that you can design and deliver a service to do. It's our responsibility that each and every one of us carries in our communities and with our families. And so, in a way, it, it, it's just an example of what we've been discussing in a number of previous items about how we will do this better if we do it together. Um, but it's really positive, and thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Jo, you wanted to come in? Thanks, yeah, just briefly. Um, Maria mentioned the Integrated Emotional Wellbeing Service for young people, and I just wanted to um, flag the great work that has been done aligned to the Brighter Futures Children and Young People Strategy for the School Wellbeing Service, the evaluation of that that's now informed this new model we've got uh, for supporting children and families um, with emotional well-being. So I think there's been a lot of work over the past few years on that all-age focus as well. Just wanted to flag that. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Ralph? Yeah, I actually forgot to say thank you to Essex Police. The, the amount of work that Essex Police has been putting to retraining officers to understand mental health has been incredible. I think it's probably outstripped a lot of other areas. So while you're here, I'd just like to say thank you on that side as well. Thank you. No, thank you. I'll make sure I send that back to officers through the Chief Constable. Thank you. Do members have any other questions? No, I think... It's recommended that members note the contents of the report, including the observations around sustainability of the programme, lend leadership support to this continued agenda. We have partners across all areas here and um, you can help lend leadership, hopefully. Are members content to approve recommendations? Yeah, agree. Before closing today's meeting, I'd like to thank officers and partners for their continued dedication to driving forward the key strategies and work streams which are vital to the board's agenda. As part of reflecting on the last year, I'd like to ask board members to very briefly, I mean briefly because we're, we're overrunning, what they felt the board could have done differently this year. Would anyone like to volunteer there? <laughs> okay, silence. Um, for me, the board's statutory priority is the strategy itself, and it will be the key focus for each meeting next year to ensure we have robust reporting and monitoring of progress to the strategy goals we set. Um, it's a year in. It will be good to see if what we said we do has worked, and hopefully this will allow for some more in-depth discussions to drive continual improvement. 
That concludes today's meeting. Thank you to all our presenters today. Thank you to all members of the board for your dedication to improving Thurrock's health and wellbeing. And I'm closing the meeting today at 12.48. Thank you.